yeah, so welcome to, to, to this evening's webinar on three steps to pregnancy with myself, Russell Davis, and Andrew Loosley. Um, a little bit like myself, for those who don't know uh, much about me or who I am, um, I'm a fertility coach and cognitive hypnotherapist, as well as an author and a speaker. And I help women and uh, couples all over the world, I guess, but get into the more healthy mindset so that they can love their life today, so they can continue their journey with a sense of peace and help them let go of the stress and get off that emotional roller coaster so they can optimize their chance of success, whether it's through natural conception or through fertility treatment. I firmly believe that too many couples go through treatment unnecessarily and the success rate of treatment is unnecessarily low because of the mind uh, and the emotions are not kind of considered in the journey. My wife, I had 10 years of experience of male and female uh, infertility and my kind of clinical experience and research echoes our personal experience uh, that our mind and emotions weren't factored in as soon as they were. Um, the magic happened. But more about my journey a bit later. Um, Andrew is a, a world leading Chinese medicine uh, fertility expert. He's a published author in three books and also a fertility speaker. Uh, uh, Andrew uh, created uh, the, natural, uh, sorry, the Natural Fertility Expert and he's the creator and host of Fertility Question Time, which is a free monthly online event where Andrew invites other world experts to join him and discuss enhancing fertility health. And he'll explain a little bit more about that later. Um, Andrew has created his treatment program called uh, the Baby Creating Plan, which I'm sure he'll explain a little bit more uh, a bit later on. So Andrew and I have been trying to come together for some time to do an event like this, mm -hmm. and we're really pleased to be uh, doing this uh, event for you this evening. So diving in to, to my three steps, so say you're going to get six steps this evening, my uh, three steps from me and three steps uh, from, from Andrew. These are kind of the top three things we say to our clients and uh, it's about going upstream, not looking at the, the nuts about nuts and bolts, what you should do and shouldn't do, don't eat this, eat this, don't do that, do this. There's a lot of advice around that kind of what you should do behavior wise and everything else. We're going upstream, looking at some of the principles that you can put in place to help um, your success on your journey. So my first three steps, my, my three steps. So first is acceptance. And often when we think about acceptance, people think it means about giving up and it really, really isn't. I want to spend a few minutes just to unpack what I mean uh, by acceptance because I really do not mean uh, giving up. The first one I think when it comes to acceptance is accepting this tough. I often I see clients, they're soldiering on, they're soldiering on. And I'll never forget my first fertility client many years ago when she came to see me. She was referred by the gynecologist who we were working with on our 10 year journey. And um, after I retrained and qualified as a coach and cognitive hypnotherapist, he started referring patients to me. And that's why I got into specializing in fertility because I suddenly realized I can give so much back to a community I've been a part of for so long. Um, and it's about recognizing it is stressful. And this first, the first client I saw, she had done three IVFs and all unsuccessful. She was, a, she was 39, approaching her 40th birthday, and she was champing the bit to get on to, to going through another, another cycle. Um, the clinics she used were quite positive about another cycle. They're going to adapt the protocol slightly. But she, to be honest, she felt a lot of unspoken pressure um, from friends and family to continue. She's putting pressure on herself to continue because the big 4-0 was coming up. And my first bit of advice was just to take a break. And I often say to clients, about focusing on Project You rather than Project Baby because it's like running a marathon. And if you've tried naturally, each month can be like a marathon. You're building up to to the, to, to that um, end of the month. Is it going to happen? Is it not? Is it going to happen? Is it not? And then you find out it hasn't been successful. And it's like getting to the finish line only to be told, oh, no, you've got to start all over again. And that's definitely how we felt on our journey. Eight years into our journey, we found out I was infertile. The first time we've ever done a test. And it feels like you, 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 you're, getting, you're getting somewhere, you're making progress, and suddenly you find you go start all over again. And it's recognizing that psychological impact and physical impact on, on your body and how stressful it is. Harvard Medical School did a study and it showed the stress levels with women going through infertility were equivalent to those with AIDS 
cancer and heart disease <laughs> and no one tells them just to relax. So I think sometimes we just take a pause and recognize the journey we're on and actually sometimes when you slow down you actually you actually speed up. Sometimes when you slow down you actually gain some time, you gain some time because you're getting your mind and your body into a much more optimal state. Just by recognizing and accepting how difficult it can be at times. A study in Sweden showed that the psychological impact of the treatment pro or having this journey was the number one reason why a couple stopped having treatment or didn't progress with treatment. That was ahead of medical advice. And that shows actually the big impact that this journey can have on us psychologically and, and thus physically, which I'll come on to. And it also demonstrates how often it can be a lonely journey because so many friends and family don't really understand what we're going through. So it's accepting where we're at, accepting what it is and how we, and what we're experiencing, and not just trying to keep soldiering on and keep soldiering on, trying to get out of uh, the situation or get off the roller coaster, thinking we need to get that success to get off the roller coaster. But actually, the ways you can get off that roller coaster, the emotional roller coaster and continue that journey with peace of mind. And the first one is acceptance. And acceptance is really not giving up. I really believe in the middle of our journey that acceptance meant giving up. Acceptance meant being the person that didn't have children. And I don't want to be that person. I don't want to be the person that had given up the chance. And we came across this place of acceptance. And we came across a place where we could continue our journey while accepting where we are. We could continue our journey while accepting whatever happens, we'd be okay. And it was a strange experience, but I'm convinced if we hadn't found that place, we wouldn't have conceived naturally like we did. It was a one in a billion chance we were told to ever conceive naturally, and it did happen ahead of us going through ICSI. So acceptance is not giving up, and it's not believing things can't change. It's about being more in the moment, accepting coming back to the present moment. It's about letting go of the needs behind the journey, recognizing actually where you are now, you have everything you need to create what you want. It's not letting go of your wishes, your hopes, your dreams. It's about being here in the here and now, holding the where you are in the here and now, hand in hand with where you want to be. When we don't accept where we're starting from, we very make it much harder to get to, to where we want to be. When we don't accept where we're starting from, we actually tether ourselves to where we are. Acceptance for me is letting go of the stories we tell ourselves about the future. Stress and anxiety is all future thinking. And acceptance about being in the here and now, letting go of judgment about what it means to be in the here and now, letting go of judgments is not fair or, or this should be different. It's not fighting reality, it's being in reality. It doesn't mean you don't want it to change, it means you're accepting where you're starting from. And as a species, we're actually designed to live in reality. We wouldn't survive if we weren't living in reality. And acceptance is not living in reality. Acceptance is telling us it should be different or wishing it should be different. And we can't make anything different until we, we start where we're at. How do we accept? As I said, one thing is about letting go of the stories we tell ourselves in our head, all the future thinking about why, what may or may not happen, what another failed test means. Our mind is, our thinking is time traveling all the time. It's about letting go of future thinking because the future doesn't exist. The future doesn't exist. The only moment that exists is the present moment. And we let go of all our future thinking, we can come back to the here and now. And we access our full potential. We access what I call our innate well-being, our soul, our true identity, because that's 
how we're designed to be in the moment. And we access a greater sense of resilience, knowing that wherever this roller coaster of life goes, we're going to be okay. Acceptance is not expecting the roller coaster of life to go in a particular direction, not needing it to go in a particular direction. We may want it to go in there, we may have a preference or a choice. If we have an expectation it should be going a certain way and it's not going there, well, that's leading to the frustration, disillusionment, and pain. This is all the thinking and the beliefs we hold that take us away from the here and now, that prevent us from being in the here and now, accepting the here and now. And so I believe it's all those thoughts and those beliefs that actually hold us back from creating the life we want. So acceptance is not giving up. Acceptance is letting go of the stories and all that future thinking and starting in the here and now because that's the only place we can start from. And it's that thinking that leads me on to my second point about be inside out and not outside in. And let me explain what I mean by that. Our thinking looks outside of us for a sense of well-being. And I want to wind back all the way back to the beginning to explain this. I don't want to listen, I don't want, don't want to listen to this for intellectual understanding because I'm about to talk about what's behind our human experience. What creates your experience on the journey? What creates your experience in any situation? And what creates our experience in any situation is our thinking. Nothing has the power to make us feel anything. A lot of my clients say, well, I'm in a very stressful job. I have a high source of stress from my work. But actually, a job doesn't have the power to make you feel anything. Nothing has the power to make us feel anything. We live in the experience of our thinking nothing else. And when we came into the world, we were pure consciousness, presence. A little baby, when their physical needs are met, are just pure presence and consciousness. They're not thinking about anything, they're just being, and we're human beings. Little children playing in the moment, they're just being in the moment. They don't worry about tomorrow, or get hung up about yesterday. They're just being. If they have a spat with a, another kid, it's soon forgotten. They don't bear grudges. They live in the moment. And that's actually our natural default state, living in the moment. But as we get a bit older, as young children, moving into towards teenage years, our emotional intelligence is not fully formed. And stuff happens to us. And we think we need to think to best cope, survive and understand those situations. Our thinking starts thinking our sense of being okay in some way is dependent on things outside of us. Whether it's what parents think of us or meeting parents or teachers' expectations or what friends think of us or children in the playground think of us. And we start looking outside of us for a sense of well-being. Well, actually, it's within us. We're born with it. And we do that as when we're that young because we don't see the bigger picture. Our emotional intelligence is not fully formed. And we do what we need to do, what we think we need to do to create that positive connection with people. Because at a young age, we think our survival is dependent on it. Being tribal people, we think our survival is dependent on being included as part of the tribe. Our caregivers think well of us. But as we get older, as adults, although we're no longer in those situations, we can see those situations in very different eyes being an adult, the thinking habits we picked up at those points become actually that, become thinking habits. And often we see life through the lenses of that thinking, looking outside of us for a sense of well-being or okayness. I'm okay if this happens or that happens, or I'm okay when that happens. 
and so do my clients say they're trying to control situations they know they're okay or the strategy they use in their career of working hard and trying to control things and making it happen through sheer effort suddenly doesn't work for their fertility and it's because we're trying to control these things on the outside because we think our sense of okayness is dependent on these things on the outside in some way and it sure looks like that it really does look like that when I first went self-employed in a different industry I used to get really really stressed when I looked at my to-do list and all the things I had to do or wanted to do and the fear would kick in that if I don't do all these things I won't be a success I won't earn enough money to feed my family whatever it may be I used to feel really, really overwhelmed like a pressure cooker in my head but just like a pressure cooker the only thing that keeps the pressure in a pressure cooker is the lid the only thing keeping the pressure in my head was my thinking and it's actually nothing to do with what I had to do in that day it was nothing to do with that situation I was looking at that situation through the lenses of my childlike thinking I'd picked up the life is pressurized or whatever it was I picked up and when we get tricked by our thinking to believe it's the situation causing that response causing that experience we start going looking for all the things we need to do to fix it to change it and that just adds to it just makes it worse we go for a ride with the feeling because you're not aware where that feeling comes from we live in a misunderstanding of where our feelings and experience has come from they don't come from the situation they come from our thinking the lenses we're looking at that situation through so we start looking outside in we're looking outside of us for a sense of well-being we're believing the stories our thinking is telling us so we're going for a ride with them trying to control those things thinking we're okay if those situations change or when those situations change and you see it in all sorts of areas of life plenty of adults saying I'll be okay if I have this amount of money in the bank or I'll be okay when I get to that level of promotion or I drive that kind of car because thinking is looking in the wrong place we never actually get there because it's the next thing it's the next thing it's the next thing we never feel that feeling inside we're looking for it never kind of scratches the itch it is like being on a hamster wheel we never get there because thinking is looking in the wrong place it's looking outside of us and it's doing it out of all innocence it started from started from a very young age and it's just become a habit and it generally generally thinks it's helping us it generally thinks it's looking in the right place it wants us to be okay it wants us to be happy but it's looking in the wrong place that's why it never actually gets there so I'm not saying this outside an approach is creating your fertility what I'm saying is it's creating your experience of the journey I do actually believe it could be impacting your fertility which I'll come on to next but it's definitely creating your experience of the journey I want to help clients find a place of peace without giving up one of the things is key to that is point them back within point them back to who they really are back to that innate well-being we're born with letting go of all that thinking in their head we can't stop thinking it's about changing your relationship with your thinking begin to recognize what it is just a thought just a story it's not about the here and now and you automatically drop into some a different place a quieter mind your intuition your instinct I call it your wisdom There's two guidance mechanisms within us, two voices that guide us. One is our thinking based on fear, 
the past and the future. The other is our intuition, grounded in the here and now. It includes our life experience, our knowledge, our intellect. And I always ask clients, when was the last time your intuition, your instinct let you down? It doesn't really because we become wise when we trust our instinct. And we get bombarded with all sorts of advice. Do this, don't do that, do this, don't do that. This is why this is about going upstream a little bit. And one of the things is to trust that intuition. Come from the inside out, not the outside in. Listen to what people say. But then trust your own intuition. Take on board what you say feel is right for you. But your soul is saying is the right path for you. And letting go of those stories about the future. Or not getting hung up about the past. Because the past is over. There's no such thing as mental scar tissue. It feels like it, but it only feels like it when we think about it. So our thinking is creating that experience. It's about recognizing thinking is not the best guidance to mechanism to life. Thinking is never about the here and now. Thinking is looking in the wrong place. You have another voice within you. It's your intuition, your instinct. When you begin to look back within, you find that sense of peace and well-being that gives you that emotional resilience to know whatever happens, you're going to be okay. Because your well-being comes from within you. It doesn't mean you don't want to have a baby, not at all. It means you can continue that journey with a sense of peace of mind and well-being within you. Now thought is a very, very, very powerful tool. Thought creates this illusion of reality that we believe, like a movie with special effects and our feelings. Because we only have a feeling our thinking. When we feel frightened or feel anxious, we think it's real because we're feeling it. But we only have a feeling our thinking. We live in the experience of our thinking, nothing else. So it's about having that understanding about where our experience comes from. It's not the circumstances. It's our thinking about it. And we can let that go. Because it's not about the here and now. It's not who you really are. It's all the thought habits you picked up over years. So you're seeing life through those scratch lenses. When you begin to see that illusion, see what's happening, you almost don't need to take the, the lenses off. You know what's happening. It reminds you of a, a story. A friend uh, was going camping with um, his wife and, and two, another couple, and they're driving. Uh, it was a summer's day. They're driving uh, off into uh, the forest to go camping. And when they got there, George says to his friend, we better go and get some firewood. It's getting late. We better go and get some firewood so we can collect some fire, some firewood and build a fire and start cooking. We don't want to be cooking in the dark. And his friend said, George, there's plenty of time, don't worry, there's plenty of time. And George's getting quite anxious, saying, no, no, come on, we need to get going, we need to get going, get, get it now. It's getting late. So they went off and collected some firewood. And when they came back, he said to his wife, come on, we need to get cooking because it's getting late, we don't want to be cooking in the dark. And his wife said, George, there's plenty of time. He said, no, it's getting late. It's getting dark. We don't be cooking in the dark. And his wife said, George, it's only four o'clock in the afternoon. You've still got your sunglasses on. As soon as he realized what happened, he'd been driving in the sunshine, got into the forest, sun had started going down, still had his sunglasses on, and it wasn't as dark as it was. It wasn't as late as it was. He didn't need to take his glasses off to suddenly calm down, relax, and see what was going on. And as soon as we begin to see the illusion of our thinking was creating our experience, we can have a different experience. And my third step is actually harnessing the mind-body link. Now, it's, most people refer to it as the mind-body link. Now, sometimes I refer to it more as the mind-body system. 
because it is one system. It's not two systems linked. It is one system. The mind affecting the body, the body affecting the mind. And I think a lot of people underestimate the power of that system, the power of the mind. There's a growing body of research that shows the power of the mind over our body, whether it's to do with fertility or other things. Um, one study comes to mind, one of my favourite ones is and the Learning Institute in America did a little finger exercise. They got people just to visualise, just to imagine doing little finger strengthening exercises. And after a few weeks, just imagining doing it for a few minutes each day, they reported a 35% muscle increase in their little finger without lifting a finger. And there's an awful lot of other research that shows the power of the mind, how it affects us biologically. I've had clients who don't ovulate who start ovulating. Would harvest a low quality, high, uh, a low number of high quality eggs, and then another cycle with IVF, they harvest a much higher number of high quality eggs. With myself, I use this mind body link even if I get a sports injury to help heal and repair myself far quicker than I would otherwise. And with fertility, Harvard Medical School did a study with Boston IVF, with women going through IVF. One group went through IVF, the other group went through IVF, but alongside their physical treatments, their medical treatments, they went through a mind-body group, six-week mind-body group. And the women that went through the mind-body group had double the success rate of the control group. And as a Israeli professor was looking at what impacts MBA transfer, and how if the patient can be relaxed during embryo transfer, perhaps the uterus will be more relaxed and they can be more successful embryo transfer. And he found when they use hypnosis to embryo transfer to keep the patient relaxed, again, they double the success rate. So I think often we underestimate the power of our mind and how it can impact us biologically. And a lot of people say, well, how do I harness this? Of course, I'm a big fan of hypnosis uh, programs. But you can also just do it yourself, visualization. Visualization is just a, a way of accessing your unconscious mind, using your imagination to access your unconscious mind. And your unconscious mind controls all your bodily processes, all your bodily functions. Some people say, oh, I can't visualize, or how do I visualize? Well, not anyone who can't visualize. Sometimes you have some misconceptions about what it means to visualize, what to expect when we visualize. Often when you visualize, you don't get a very vivid mental image. Some people do. Some people it's more fleeting, or it's a sense of it. And that's okay. That's just as okay. And when some people say, well, what do I visualize? So it's anything your imagination guides you to. We, all our minds are different. All our minds are powerful. And by me telling people what to visualize, well, that's using my mind. And when you're accessing your unconscious mind and use your imagination, it makes it far, far more powerful. Using your imagery, your metaphors. And it doesn't have to be biological or even accurate. I'll give you an example. Um, if I start to feel a bit of a cold coming on or a virus, I'm very rarely ill. If my family have maybe come down with something or there's something going around and I start to feel a little bit of it, I imagine my immune system being really strong. Like a, a, an army dressed in white and more and more being added to their number. So I'm really feeling like boosting my immune system. Or if I feel a bit of a virus in me, I imagine a little Pac-Man, a 1980s computer game, Pac-Man going around my system eating up the virus. Yeah, crazy. Perhaps I played too many computer games as a kid. But it just shows it doesn't have to be biological. And those things can help guide your unconscious mind to do what you want it to do because you know what it means for you. You know what it represents for you. If I pull a muscle, I literally imagine construction workers in my body repairing that muscle. And I heal far more quicker than people expect. So you can start to visualize your body doing what you want it to do, even in preparation for any treatment, or as you go through your monthly cycle, balancing hormones, whatever it is you want to be, imagine it doing. 
I actually feel it doing that. Dr. David Hamilton is a, uh, an expert on the mind-body link and the placebo effect and all those kind of things. He used to work for a drugs company looking at testing of drugs and couldn't understand why such high percentage of the placebo uh, drug worked. And often, that's often dismissed. But there's a great number of drugs get taken off the market because the placebo drug is as effective if not more effective. So he gave up working for this drug company and devoted his life to studying this placebo effect and the mind-body link. And I love his term, feelingization, that as you do a visualization, as you imagine your body doing what it wanted to do, imagine how it feels knowing it's doing it. Get into the feeling of it as well. I can add to the power of it. So the, my first step is yeah, harnessing that mind-body link. I think these three principles, these three principles can really underpin everything you do on your journey. I personally, I haven't got time to go through my do, uh, uh, journey in detail, but my test results were disastrous on every front. When I try to improve it, doing all the good things I believe in, still believe in those things are really helpful. My test results actually got worse. I couldn't believe they could get worse. I think because I wasn't accepting it. I was so scared it wasn't going to happen. I was so scared we'd never have children. My fear, my mindset overruled all the good stuff I was doing physically and biologically. As soon as I let go of that, as soon as I began to create more of a life I love in that moment, I was continuing our journey. And that's where the magic happened. If you'd like to find out more about what I do and, and how to go deeper in this, you can go to my website, the, the fertilemind.net, and remind you at the end, where you can download a Getting Started pack, where you can begin to dive deeper in harnessing this, the mind and, and letting go of the outside-in approach, becoming more inside-out to help put you back on a, a better psychological place, a place that can give you mental and emotional and physical health. So it's the fertile mind on it if you want to find out more. And I'm just going to turn to see if you've got any questions. If you have got any questions, please do put them in now if you haven't done them already. Okay, no questions coming so far. I should just pause for a moment as Andrew gets ready for his bit just to see if there are any questions coming in. We may come to questions right at the end if people are still typing questions. So, Russell, can I jump in? <laughs> yes, of course. Because, um, there's, there's a question that I can see that Joe Roberts has asked. Okay. I don't know if it's on your screen. So shall I read it out for you? Yes, and please, yeah. um, Joe says, is there is there a fine line between visualization and thinking too much? Yes, I think that's a great question. I think there is. I think visualization, you know it's the imagination. You're playing with it, you're connecting to you, you can imagine your body doing that. But you're doing it in the here and now. You're grounded to the here and now. So you know where you are, you're 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 accepting where you are today, you're being where you are today, and you're guiding your body to do what you want to do in that moment today. Thinking too much is often about the future. Thinking takes you into the future. And thinking is often filled by judgment how things should be different or why about whether, whether things will be different or not. I tell you the, the real difference, it is a fine line between the two, but the real indicator is your feeling your state of mind as you do it. If you feel a state of well-being, it's usually a sign you're grounded in the here and now. And as you visualize your body doing what you wanted to do with your imagination, that feels okay, that feels good. If you're feeling stressed or worried or nervous or fearful, that's normally a sign you've got caught into a story, into thinking, future thinking. How things should be different or they may not be different or how you need them to be different. I think the difference is thinking is filled by things needing to be different. Visualization is about connecting to where you are now and guiding your body from where you are now, about where you want it to be, from where you're starting from. I don't know if I've made that clear. Yeah. 
thank you for reading that. For some reason, the questions haven't come off my screen. That's right. Welcome. That's the only one I can see at the moment. Okay. Great. Okay. In that case, I hand over to to you, Andrew, and we can come to questions again at the end if there are any additional questions. So, Andrew, thank you. Great. Thanks, Russell. That was that was really not really nice. Nice isn't the best word, but it was really um, really interesting and so in alignment with. Uh, just my experience of working with people for a long time now I've been doing what I do for 18 years and um, you know I've spent my own in my own life my own journey sort of to a greater degree looking at these three aspects that you focused on um, in varying ways and um, one of the the big uh, focuses for myself and and for us on and the program that I run with our clients is to try to encourage them to be in the moment and actually to just experience life as it is right now and not be so caught up in past and future thoughts and, and so forth. So it was great. It was really nice to, to listen to and, um, and just really refreshing, especially before doing a talk as well. <laughs> this is a <laughs> nice way to ease myself in and slow myself down because this week has been a crazy week for me as are most of my weeks, but, um, you know, so it's really lovely. Thanks. So, uh, Officially, I'd just like to say hello to everybody that's listening. Thanks for listening in and uh, for joining us. Um, if you don't know me, uh, my name is Andrew Loosely, and I'm the founder of naturalfertilityexpert.com and the creator and host of Fertility Question Time, which is um, a, a large monthly free online fertility event that I host and, and run. And uh, each month I get people to come and join me um, and we talk through a particular topic. Today, I'm the guest on Russell's event, which is fantastic. And it's lovely to be a guest and not have to be the one organizing everything. Um, so thanks for having me here, Russell. It's really a real pleasure um, to be here. Um, I am a Chinese medicine fertility expert author and public speaker on natural fertility treatment and of course also on the subject of Chinese medicine. And Chinese medicine, if you're not familiar with it, has a really extensive knowledge on reproductive health and it has a documented history of around two and a half thousand years of treatment of fertility issues. So the Chinese have, have known for a very long time that or have this have had this uh, understanding and idea that infertility in most cases is a temporary situation that needs a specific approach to overcome it and that approach until recently until really the last hundred years has always been a natural approach and um, has been a combination of of physical and emotional mind aspects and, and treatments so joining together today with Russell is is just really is really great because you know everything that he said is really a, a part of the foundation of what Chinese medicine has been talking about for, for many thousands of years that emotions play a, a very very big factor in our well-being and also in the creation of disease according to to the ancient Chinese if we go back about 4,000 years you'll find in Chinese medicine references to the disturbance of the seven emotions causing physical disharmony within the body so it's no wonder that modern science is now discovering that oh look the mind has an effect on the physical body <laughs> um, actually humanity has known it for a very very long time um, and uh, it, it's great to uh, for, for us to be here and, and share this information um, with anyone really that wants to listen and particularly for people on a fertility journey so for the past 18 years I've been supporting couples around the world with my three-step program which is called the baby creating plan and this uses this Chinese medicine fertility approach that I've been talking about and I've been really fortunate to be able to support thousands of people on their journey to creating their families and that for me is a, is a great honor and, and a pleasure to, to be a part of now, when Russell uh, asked me to join him today for this talk and share my top three tips, it, it was really exciting because we decided that we could actually focus on a more kind of practical approach to your f um, fertility journey rather than just the normal eat this, don't eat this, as Russell said at the beginning, and you know the, the standard kind of information that isn't always actually um, suitable for everybody listening. So we thought we'd actually talk about more practical aspects obviously Russell focusing on the mind and 
I'm going to focus basically on your fertility journey and the three most important steps to take on that journey. Because the thing that I've realized over, well, come to realize and, and built into my treatment and my program over the last 18 years um, is a, a three-step structure. And so those steps I want to share with you because I know that if you can put those into place to any degree, with or without my help, um, then you w it, this will help you to transform your fertility journey and your whole experience. And so today I'm going to talk really about those three steps and it, it is a much more practical approach. It's about getting things in order, about looking at what the first step should be, what the second step should be, what the third step should be and how they tie together and how you use that kind of system. It's a system I created a long time ago, but I'm not going to take um, the, the credit for all of it um, because I, I basically sort of took it from the, the Chinese system that has been in existence for a long time, but not very many people seem to use that system. So I put that in place a long time ago and built a program all around that. And when you know what these three steps are and how you can use them, then you can begin to structure your journey more efficiently and basically help you get to your goal of having your baby a lot quicker and, and in a much easier way and in a less overwhelming um, and anxiety producing way as well, which is really important. So if there's time at the end, um, I'd also like to share with you a few real life stories. And I, I do this quite a lot because I just think it's a, a really lovely way um, for you to actually see examples of people that have been through uh, this kind of approach and that these three steps are actually a real thing and that they have real effects. So um, I'll, I'll try and put those in towards the end. So with regards to the three steps, the important factor, regardless of where you are on your journey, whether you're trying naturally or whether you're considering IVF in the future, and whether you've only been trying for one cycle or whether you've been trying for many, many years, the really important factor is that you need to start at step one, okay, and work your way through systematically all of these steps. So what I want to do is just go through these one by one um, individually and, and talk about them. I think, Russell, you're doing the slides, aren't you? Which is great, and it's there. <laughs> so step one is about getting clear and focused on your current fertility health. Okay, so this is about assessing where your health is now. I meet, well, I can't tell you how many people I meet a year. It's many hundreds of people, and um, most of them are not very clear on where their health is at that point of when they meet me. They may have had some types of examinations or tests at some point in the past, but if I was to ask, you know, 10 people, 10 random people on a fertility journey, what do you know about your current health situation right now? Most of them wouldn't be able to give me an updated um, uh, sort of profile or, or idea. So step one is about getting clear and focused on your current fertility health. And it, you know, it can be really difficult to address anything in life if we don't know what it is that actually needs to be addressed. And the same is true on a fertility journey. If you don't know why you're not conceiving or carrying to full term, then how can you easily address it? So the starting point is to find out what your body is doing and why there is a delay or problem and what the cause of this is. And to do this, you need to complete a detailed assessment of your health. And there are basically three ways that you can do it. The first is that you can use Western medicine and you can run a series of tests and scans and investigations. The second is that you can use natural medicine or in this case, I'm going to be talking about Chinese medicine all the way through because that's what I practice. But Chinese medicine obviously falls into the natural medicine group. Um, and you can use Chinese medicine to diagnose your fertility health. Or third, you can use a combination of the two. Now, I always suggest using option three, uh, a combination of the two. And the reason is that when you combine Chinese and Western medicine diagnostic skills together, you have a complete view of the human body, both physically and functionally. Western medicine is really good at finding the physical issues that exist in people's bodies, such as hormone imbalance, um, PCOS, fibroids, endometriosis, blocked fallopian tubes, those kind of issues. Okay, they're all physical manifestations. And Western medicine is good at finding those. It has tests and investigations that can um, reveal that those things are in existence. 
But Chinese medicine is great at finding the causes of these problems. And that's something that Western medicine is currently very poor at. And Western medicine can tell you that you have an issue, but can't actually tell you why. Now, when you bring the two disciplines together, you have a completely holistic system that looks at the what and what it is and the why, how it came about. So to achieve this, what you ideally need to do is complete some type of natural fertility health assessment that assesses you using these two disciplines, using Chinese medicine to cover the natural aspect and also Western medicine um, to look at test results and investigations to look at the physical aspect and see what is actually presenting itself and Chinese medicine to look at what the cause of that presentation is within your own body. So the starting point is to get investigated and tested using Western medicine so that you know what is physically going on. And this provides you with a, a detailed review of the physical aspects of your health and how they're presenting. And then you can look at your health through the eyes of Chinese medicine to understand why those things are presenting. So that is the best order that I found over the years is that people go to get tested from a Western viewpoint and investigated um, to, to a, a reasonable degree and then look um, at Chinese medicine to find out why those things are there if there is anything there. So if you have, for example, um, you know, an imbalance in a particular hormone such as FSH, in Chinese medicine, we want to look at what the cause of that is. Knowing that the FSH is high is kind of helpful to us, but it actually doesn't tell us anything else other than it is high. In Chinese medicine, we want to know why. What is it within your body that's producing that result? Um, and when we know what that is, what your own mechanism for creating that situation is, then we can start to actually do something about it. So with Western medicine, there are five levels um, of investigation that you can go to with women, okay, and four for men. Now today, because of time, I'm going to just talk about the first two um, because it's just such a, a, a big area. If you want to know about the other levels, I have uh, given a previous talk, which you can find on my website at naturalfertilityexpert.com. And if you just sign up to Fertility Question Time, the free events that we run each month, you can get access to the replays. And there is an entire 90 minute session of me talking about these tests in great detail as to when you do them, how you do them, what they tell you, and so forth. So if you need more information after I've gone through this, then uh, you know, feel free to go there and sign up for, for that free replay. So looking at the tests um, for women, basically to get clear from a Western perspective, the very first thing we want to do is look at a hormone profile. Okay, and this is with a blood test. And basically this includes looking at hormones such as FSH, estradiol, luteinizing hormone, prolactin, testosterone, checking your thyroid, checking your cortisol level, um, and checking progesterone levels as well. And whilst you're doing that kind of blood test, you can also check for some vitamins and minerals, such as vitamin D, B6, B12, zinc, and folate. And all of these will give a good insight as to how your body is working in terms of hormone production and also looking at the most important nutrient levels and making sure that those are okay. Measuring your cortisol level will also help identify whether stress is having a physical impact on um, your body as, uh, as well. And that's something that can then be um, adjusted. The other investigation for women that I feel is really important at the beginning is an ultrasound scan. And this is a very particular one that um, measures your antral follicle count. And what this does is it basically assesses the situation in terms of your follicular activity and levels, i.e. the numbers of follicles that you have within the ovaries that are present in that particular cycle. So each month, for example, you may have 10, 12, 15 um, follicles that are present that come to the surface of the ovaries. And from those follicles, one ovary will become dominant and release an egg. What this scan does is it measures um, for you how many are actually present in that cycle. And that number can be looked at in relation to your age. And you can then see whether you are actually within a, you know, a, a good kind of uh, area of number of follicles for your age. And that then starts to give you an idea of the time frame that you have for trying naturally and actually understanding when IVF might be, might be necessary or might be something that you need to do. 
So, of course, these kind of things do need some guidance, and I do suggest working with a practitioner or getting some help with them. It's not stuff really that you should try and interpret yourself, but you need to know what it is that you should be doing for those kind of first steps. Now, for men, what we want to look at to start with is a semen analysis and, and review that and see what it's like. If there's anything low on there, then you could uh, have the guy checked um, for vitamins and minerals, which are the same as for women, and make sure that those are all okay. And if the results come back as very severe, then he might need further investigation, including a hormone profile as well. But again, that's once you get to that kind of level, you are looking at getting extra guidance for that. And these are the two kind of most important initial levels of testing for men and women. And they should be carried out really every six months on a fertility journey so that you're aware of how your physical health is changing. Most people just get them checked once every couple of years um, and, and never really know, never have an up-to-date profile of, of what's going on. So as I said, if you want to sort of hear more about those or learn more about those, um, there's plenty of that on my website um, that you can listen to. So that's the conventional side. That's the Western medicine side. It's looking at your body physically. It's looking at what is actually presenting itself physically. What the other part of the equation is that ideally you want to look at your day-to-day -day health and find out what is going on in your body that might be then causing any of those um, presentations. Now you might get a completely clear hormone profile or your vitamins and minerals will be fine and that's okay but still there is no conception and again that's where Chinese medicine comes in. That's where looking at the underlying aspects of what's going on in your body is, is very helpful and will give you a lot more insight into what is working well, what's not working so well and what needs to be worked on. Chinese medicine works through three key areas of diagnosis. It works through observation, and that's just looking at you. The practitioner just observes you. It's not something you particularly notice. We don't stare at you or anything like that, but we just observe you, and we see how you hold your posture, how you move, if there is any um, difference in, in uh, tone, skin tones, anything with the eyes, anything with the lips in terms of coloration, all sorts of things like that. We look at hair, um, and we, we look for really obvious, noticeable factors, such as someone having really pale skin. Um, so observation is a big part of, of our diagnostic skills when we're working with someone. We also work through questioning and questioning um, allows us to have a really detailed understanding of what's going on within your body that you're experiencing day to day. What are your bowel movements like? What's your energy like? What's your appetite like? Your sleep quality, your body temperature, all of these things that no one can know about you. Those are the things that are, are discovered through questioning you. And um, we have an immense amount of questions that we go through in Chinese medicine. And each of those questions is very specifically links to a different internal function of your body. And the answer tells us what is going on. Now, with women, we extend that and we go obviously much deeper in terms of questioning with regards to the menstrual cycle. Uh, we talk through in detail through the period, through menstruation, post-menstruation, ovulation, post-ovulation, pre-period. And we talk through that in great detail to try to understand what is going on and how things are actually working. And then the third um, aspect of diagnosis that's used in Chinese medicine is, is tongue observation. So we look at the tongue, we look at the shape, the color, the size, the texture, and the coating of the tongue. And this gives us further information. Now, all of these three areas in Chinese medicine basically give us different elements of information, and that is put together by the practitioner that's assessing you, and it's basically concluded, and, uh, and a diagnosis is reached from that. Now, the Chinese medicine findings and diagnosis will then be combined with the Western medicine findings, and a complete diagnosis is reached. And once you've achieved this, then you have a complete picture of your current health in terms of the physical aspects of your body and how it's presenting, and the underlying causative factors and underlying imbalances that may be existing in your body as well. And you'll know what's working well and what's not working so well and how this translates into your current fertility picture. When I do this um, assessment with my clients, just to give you an example, and I do this either online or in person, depending on where they are, because my program is a global program. I work with people all over the world. This lasts for about two to two and a half hours. So if you go anywhere and you look for this kind of um, support, you do want to have a detailed assessment. If it's a 30 minute session, it probably isn't detailed enough. So just bear that in mind that it needs to be something really quite substantial. 
And once once I have this level of understanding of my client's health, then I can begin to advise on what should be changed to make the necessary changes. As I said before, right at the beginning of step one, if we don't know what needs to be addressed, then how do we take action on it? So the Chinese understood this a long time ago and basically said, well, you know what? First of all, we have to find out what the problem is. So first of all, we have to investigate. Nowadays, we're really lucky. We can look into the body in a way that we could never, that we you know, practitioners weren't able to do before in Chinese medicine. 100 years ago, 200 years ago, there were no scans. There were no blood tests. There was no understanding of the body from that perspective. But there was already an existing, an existing health system which knew how to look at the body from a different perspective. So now we have the great fortune of being able to bring both of these together and give you a really complete view and a truly holistic view, actually, of how the body is presenting physically and how it's presenting um, in terms of the creation of that physical um, presentation. So that's step one. It's quite a big one and there's a lot lot there but it's really in honesty it's the most important step really or because it's the starting point it's getting clear and focused on your current health then you know what's going on it's only with the addition of chinese medicine that you'll find the underlying causative factors and when you find those that will give you such great insight into your health and what then needs to be done about it to to help you get to your goal okay so step two um this is um, basically to um, create uh, a strategy and plan of action. Okay, and once you've completed step one, you can then move on to step two. Because you have this uh, clarity, you have this diagnosis, you have this understanding of, of what is actually going on in your body and um, what is working well and what's not working so well. Um, with that clarity, you can then move on and you can actually start to put things into action. Um, and you can start to create plan and it's really important to have some kind of structure to your journey you know to, to just go from treatment to treatment trying one thing after another which is what many people do on on various levels of recommendation this is a very difficult and and confusing way to to work so by putting this step by step these three steps actually into uh, into action you can follow that through so you get your diagnosis then you create a strategy plan and then you go on to step three so once you've done step one and you're clear on your health, you can then move on to start planning what your next steps should be. And I suggest sitting down to write this out as a document. Um, and you can, if you're on a journey on your own, um, you know, try to get someone to help you with that. If you're on a journey as part of a couple, then do that together if you can. And sit down and talk through what the discoveries have been so far and, uh, and put those on that on that plan and um, and look at then the types of things that you can do to actually rectify that. So if there are some health issues, if there are some hormonal imbalances, if there are some underlying factors that have been discovered in Chinese medicine, look at the options there and available to you to be able to actually start to rectify those and, and work on them and uh, spend some time working on those things and remeasuring them again and making sure that they're improving. So creating this plan is all about just knowing what's happened so far in step one and then looking at, OK, we want to do treatment. How long should we do treatment for? What is the general advice? If we use something like herbal medicine, what do we need to do? What do we need to how long do we need to use that for, et cetera? When should we do IVF and put this all into um, a, a, an action plan. And it's really just about looking at the best options available to you and, and kind of creating an ABC type of step-by-step -step plan so that you know what action to take, when to take the action, and how long to take it for. And um, it's really about looking at the next kind of three to six months of your journey and assessing what you can do um, to take action to improve your fertility health and get yourself in the best place possible for either natural or assisted conception. And on that note, um, I want to sort of mention, and I will come to it in a minute as well in a bit more detail, but, you know, even if you are on a journey, on an IVF journey, looking at natural medical or medicine options um, is, a, is a great way to go in advance of it. And I'll explain in a minute why. But um, to have a, a foundation of treatment there before you go on to assisted treatments um, can make a really big difference. So it's important to kind of build those or look at those options and, and see if they, they are suitable and build those into your plan of action. So 
at this point, you kind of look at the treatment options, you look at how long you might do them for, and you look, you consider other factors such as IVF or possibly egg donation, maybe even adoption, depending on where you are. And that's obviously different for every single person. And you build those into a plan over the next three, six, nine, or 12 months. And this plan is something that if it's written on paper, you can come back to again and again, and you can revise it. But you've always got something to go back to in those times of, of struggle and those times of thinking, gosh, I don't know what's happening. I don't know what to do next. Well, okay, when was the last time we had our bloods checked? When was the last time I had a scan? When did I, you know, and so forth. And you can start to then actually have a system in place for working through your journey. So steps one and two, basically, um, to assess your fertility health, get clear on what's going on, and then create um, a strategy and an action plan. Again, if you work with a practitioner, um, when my clients do this, um, this is done for them. This is something I do. Um, but of course, you can do this yourself as well. Uh, it's a little bit harder, and there are certain aspects that you will need help with from a practitioner, such as the assessment. But putting a plan together, that's something you could potentially do yourself as well. So step three, um, this is about applying treatment. Um, it's, it's applying treatment, it's monitoring that treatment, and it's reviewing the treatment. Okay, And the Chinese way of thinking about fertility generally is that good health equals good fertility. If you're experiencing a delay in conception or problems with pregnancy, then it indicates that there are possibly aspects of your body that need support and help. When our bodies are balanced and working in their natural healthy condition, then reproduction is possible. And when it comes to the treatment phase here in step three, there are many, many different treatments to choose from within actually just the Chinese and Western medicine um, uh, traditions alone. So even if you're moving towards an IVF or other assisted cycle, I would still suggest looking at Chinese medicine to work on the underlying aspects that have been found in step one. And it is incredibly rare in Chinese medicine that we don't find some kind of imbalance within pretty much every single human being. Because as we age and as we go through life and we go through emotional stresses and physical stresses, things get out of balance. And I do think, and I'm sure Russell will probably agree, that the modern way of life is not particularly conducive to a healthy mind. <laughs> um, and that disturbance sometimes in the mind and issues that we have to deal with every day, stress, etc., they all start to have um, an effect physically and, and that takes its toll. So for most people, there will be some underlying aspect that can be seen in Chinese medicine that will need some kind of support and help. So even if you're moving towards a, an assisted cycle, I'd still suggest that you look at um, preparing as well in advance for that cycle. And if you're trying naturally, then most definitely um, Chinese medicine, natural medicine of other types also can be very supportive and helpful. Now, the reason for this suggestion is that um, treatments like IVF are designed to bypass the natural processes of the body and create an embryo for you. Now, this is fine if there is um, a problem with egg fertilization naturally, but IVF will not change your fertility health in any way at all. Its focus is to bypass the natural processes and produce an embryo. If your fertility issue is related to poor egg, sperm or endometrial quality or an implantation issue, then IVF can't help this. But this is where Chinese medicine and other aspects of natural medicine step in. Once the underlying causes of the problems are adjusted and your egg, sperm and endometrial quality have improved, then IVF stands a much greater chance of success. And as an example, on average, an IVF cycle has a success rate of around 25 to 30 percent. Now, when I work with my clients using the Chinese medicine system of assessing their health, um, and then applying treatment for a time period and, and dealing with the underlying factors that are there, um, and our clients then go for IVF, what we find is that we have a success rate around 71% of uh, positive pregnancy. So this, the only difference that is happening there is that there is preparation of that person's body and adjustment of their health in advance of doing an IVF cycle, which means that their body can actually then take over and do the things that it needs to do. And for many, many people, failure with IVF cycles is, is going to be linked to egg quality, sperm quality, or an implantation issue.
Now, Chinese medicine works on rebalancing the underlying causes of these issues to transform your fertility health to get your body working again as it should naturally. And once you do this, then your chances of conception, um, both naturally and with IVF, will greatly increase. And treatment generally for, the, for any type of natural um, approach should be about three to six months. And um, there are lots of different treatments available um, within the Chinese medicine system. The one that I recommend the most is herbal medicine because this is the number one leading treatment used in China and has been so for two and a half thousand years for fertility treatment. And that should really be supported with dietary therapy, emotional support and well-being and lifestyle changes as well if necessary. Now, the other important thing is that when you're having treatment of any kind, um, it needs to be monitored and you need to be really assessed at least twice a month, particularly if you're having natural treatment. It needs to be regular monitoring and assessment and um, there should be frequent reviews of the treatment and progress that you're making. See what progress you're making. Sorry. As your fertility health is being treated via your general health, you will actually start to notice an improvement in the way that your body works day to day and you begin to feel healthier. Now, if at any point you um, reach a, a stage of, of being sort of unclear as to what's going on with treatment or where you are on your journey, you can then revisit these steps and you can kind of go back to the beginning, uh, go back to a kind of planning point and say, right, okay, what, what have we done? Well, it's been eight months since we did any recent tests. Go back to the beginning, do some more tests, check it out and so forth and work through those steps. And um, it, it's... Uh, it, kind of the, this three-step system has to sort of be really approached in a cyclical way. It's kind of that you go step one, step two, step three, do step three, which is the treatment part for a time period, see what the effects are, and then possibly go back to step one and, and kind of re-strategize, think it through, check out, have some more tests done if necessary, work through the second part, create your next plan of action, and then work through through step three of applying treatment. And, and it works in a cycle like that. Now, most people, if they have um, professional support, will actually um, only need to do that cycle once or twice. Um, but sometimes it can take longer, of course. But um, kind of in, in a nutshell, those are the three, it's not really a nutshell, I've spent ages talking, but <laughs> those are the three points, um, the three kind of steps that I really suggest that people build into their fertility um, journey. Just getting clear uh, and focused on your current situation and your health from a Western and ideally a Chinese medicine viewpoint, but maybe you'll find another viewpoint, um, but a natural medicine viewpoint that can look at the underlying factors of what's going on. Then create a strategy and plan of action, and that's about the type of treatment that you're going to use and how long for, and then apply that treatment and monitor it and review it. So hopefully that's given you some um, insight uh, into the three steps that I use with my clients and the way that I uh, recommend anyone on a fertility journey to structure their uh, structure their journey so that you have a direction to work in and move in and not feel that you're just kind of moving, um, I won't use the word aimlessly, but just sort of, you know, this feeling that you kind of go from one thing to the next, not always being clear as to why it's happening. Someone says this is good for fertility, so Maybe you try that. Someone else says, no, it's not. Go and try this. And you try that and so forth. I meet so many people in that situation. And so many years ago, I decided to create more of a structure and look at this kind of step-by-step -step process that people can logically and methodically work through. So, Russell, how are we doing for time? We've got over started, if that's okay. So we're going to carry on as long as it takes any questions or anything else. Um, those Absolutely. Of you to go, that's fine. The recording will still run. But... I've got um, a, just a, uh, a couple of um, real life stories here that I wanted to share, but I can just um, I could just share one, actually, um, just to give a kind of feeling of, of how this can how this sort of structure can work. Yeah, please do. But, um, there's a, a lady that came to see me um, uh, last year or possibly a year before, actually, and um, she was 42 and a half when she came. And that half's quite important because <laughs> she was sort of on her way to being 43. And she'd been trying for about two and a half years. Um, and um, we basically uh, she joined us um, on the program and um, we took this three step approach with her of assessing her 
getting a strategy in place and doing treatment. And during the assessment, um, we discovered that there were some cycle issues with her. Um, the timing of her cycle wasn't quite right. Certain aspects of it were, well, the whole cycle was shorter. Her luteal phase was particularly short. There were lower body temperatures at that time of the cycle. And there were lots of other physical small things that would often be missed in Western medicine um, that we found that were actually really quite relevant to her situation. And um, she'd previously been for IVF and it had failed, unfortunately. And um, it had failed kind of quite severely, actually, in, in the sense that she didn't get any fertilized eggs. So she had no embryos to transfer at all, or no embryos at all. Um, so um, the cycle was stopped and she was told that her egg quality was was not very good, not good at all, and that she had to do egg donation, and that was the only option for her. And of course, she was devastated, and at nearly 43, was getting really, really stressed and, and worried. So we put together a strategy for her, and that was to, to basically work with her in Chinese medicine for six months until her 43rd birthday roughly and if she hadn't conceived naturally by that point that we would then go on and do IV uh, she would then go on and do IVF and we would continue to support her she reached the end of the six months and she hadn't conceived so we weren't as delighted as we could be but she had a lot of health improvements um, during that six month time period um, and um, she decided that she would uh, would go for IVF um, one or two cycles later so she spent another month on the program um, preparing herself for IVF mentally and physically and emotionally and financially and so forth. And during that, that seventh month, she actually conceived naturally. And um, so in total, we worked with her using herbal medicine and emotional support, actually. We worked quite a bit with her emotionally. Um, and uh, it, it took seven months for her to conceive naturally. And she gave birth to a healthy baby boy when she was um, actually just over 43 years old. Well, yeah, quite a bit over 43 years old. <laughs> um, my math is not very good. Um, and, um, you know, this is just an example of how having that structure in place, having assessment and clarity at the beginning we actually i actually met her before her ivf and I, I we knew that she should ideally do natural treatment first but she just was under pressure from the conventional side because of her age um, nothing else but just her age and they said you know basically if you don't do it now you won't ever get pregnant so she kind of came back to me and said well i, I don't really want to do six months trying naturally if you know, I could do IVF and I could be pregnant next month, um, but it didn't work. So she came back anyway, did the program and uh, and took this approach and got pregnant naturally, which is great. I won't share the other two stories just because of time, I think. So, but I thought that would be um, just a nice way to, to end off just so that you can see those three steps sort of in action and how assessing and creating a plan of action and doing that also with some support is really um, beneficial. Mm. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you. Any questions do get typing now? And just as people may be doing that, I reflected on actually the synergies between what you and I said about you say starting by getting clear and focused on your current health, it's like accepting or understanding, accepting where you are and having the information to know where you are and accepting that's where you're starting from. And then having that strategy and a plan of action being guided by what you've been guided by, having that plan to guide you. Uh, when I was saying be guided by your intuition and your thinking, you have a same kind of thing, knowing what you're being guided by and yeah. have that one or two of you as you go along. Yeah. Absolutely. And, you know, in Chinese medicine, there is this concept that there is a truth. There is a, 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 a reality is not the probably the right word but you know there is a, a natural existence a natural truth and and we can follow that and that's kind of what i sort of started to think or, or experience really with my clients over the years was just that there was a lot of disorder a lot of um a lot of chaos unintentionally of course but because people mm. are on a fertility journey and they don't ever expect to be on that journey mm. you know and there's confusion and everyone's telling you something different. Mm -hmm. So what I realized was the easiest way for my clients and for myself to create a program that's supportive is to, to try mm -hmm. to find what that natural progression is and that truth. And the first mm -hmm. thing is to find out where you are, mm -hmm. find out what's actually mm -hmm. there. Yeah. And that is, it ab absolutely fits in with the three points yeah. you're talking about yourself. Yeah. Yeah. So, I can't see any questions coming in just yet. If there are, please do. Um, but in the meantime, I should remind people of where they can find more information about what we both do. Um, 
then my website is thefertilemind.net and there's a free getting started uh, pack to get people going on understanding more about how the mind may be affecting their journey but also how to get into that more healthy kind of peaceful mindset and um, support whatever process you're, you're, you're going through and then Andrew's website naturalfacilityexpert.com where you can sign up for uh, the monthly Q&A's and as, as he says get back access to the, the back catalogue to find out more detail about um, some of the, the process and the steps that Andrew shared but also you can download your, your book I think from your site as well can't you? Absolutely yeah so if, if any of um, if anyone listening today would like to get a copy a free copy of my um, book you can download that actually at naturalfertilityexpert.com and you can sign up to the free guide you'll get the it, it has lots and lots of information in it a lot about testing actually and and these three steps and many other aspects too and uh, there's a whole series of um, uh, emails uh, like information emails that you'll get sort of uh, on the back of that as well so tons and tons of free um, information there uh, if you want to sign up for that great Thank you, Andrew. Thank you for those being participating and listening. Thank That's you awesome. for the comments that are coming in. So, one saying thank you, Andrew Russell. This has been very affirming for me. We really, hopefully there has been. I it's been a very a quick canter through some of this stuff, but hopefully it just points you maybe in the right direction where you can go further upstream and get some of the principles in place so you can continue your journey from a much stronger position, both physically and um, psychologically. And Andrew and I both welcome any contact direct for our websites and we're happy to continue the conversation um, in any way you want. So thank you, Andrew. Thank you for those listening, and look forward to connecting soon.